So, who do people say that the Christian or the Christians are? That is not important. They can say whatever they want to say. But what do you think? Because the question Jesus put to them, Matthew chapter 16 from verse 13, in that course of Philipp, Philippi, who, first question, who do men, the people say that I am? They can call him any name. Some said, you are professor saying so. Others said, you are that. Matthew chapter 16. Verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples. Caesarea Philippi was named after an emperor of Rome. Caesar. Philip. That town was named after him. The coast of that city, he asked the disciples, whom do men say that I, the son of man, I am? I'm just a human being like any one of you. What are the people saying about me? What do they say that I am? They give a lot of answers. They said, some said you are John the Baptist. Some said you are Elijah. They see Elias in King James. Elijah. Others say that you are Jeremiah. Others said you are uh, one of the prophets. But he asked them, but whom do you say that I am? So what you say about yourself matters. It's, it's what matters, not what people say about you. They say you are Christians. Oh, Christian is not even the name. But what do you say? Then Peter said to him that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So Jesus is not accepting what the people are saying about him, what name other they give to him. He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That's very important because he told them that what do people say that I, the son of man, because I'm a human being, I stand in your front. So what are they saying about me? They said you are a prophet or you are John the Baptist. They mentioned the powerful prophet. Then they said, okay, but whom do you say that I am? Because that's your opinion is more important. It's your opinion that is most important. And Peter said, well, they say you are that, but you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That's more important. People can call you a Christian, fine. But what do you say yourself? You are the child of God, the son of God. Yes, That's very important. It's not what people are telling, talking about you. So when Peter said that, Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjuna. Flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto you, you are Peter. He said you are Simon Barjuna. Peter was not his name. But because he was able to define him, the opinion he has concerning him, he said, you are Peter. Peter means stone. And upon this rock, yeah, you are Peter, stone. But upon this rock, in fact, stone and rock are different things. Stone is not the same as rock. Upon this rock. So what is he referring to and calling rock here? What is he referring to as rock in this context? Who can tell me? Is it to Peter? Because Peter means stone. But what is he referring to as rock here? Is he upon this rock? I obeyed my church. What is he referring to as rock here? And uh, to what is he referring to as that solid foundation? Christ. Christ is the rock. So here he's saying that upon this rock, of course, he was referring, he, he knew that Peter knew it. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He thought maybe he, 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 the, uh, the apostles knew that. 
So that's why he didn't mention that upon the Christ, I'm going to build my church. Because he thought maybe they knew it. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, the verse 4. The verse 4, 1 Corinthians 10 saying that, all the Israelites, referring to the Israelites when they passed through the Red Sea, they all drink the spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So this one was known to the Jews. That's why Jesus, in that Matthew uh, writing, he didn't explain. That's said this rock. So the rock is referring to in, in, in that context verse it, verse 18. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gate of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto you the, the, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you shall bound here on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. The rock that all these things are built is Christ. How? This the foundation built on this rock. Upon this rock, it means that when you know that Jesus is the Christ, you also became like him. First John chapter 5, verse 1. Look at what is there. Who can read it for me? First John chapter 5, verse 1. First John chapter 5. The verse 1 says, Anyone who soul ever believe that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Anyone who believes that. So Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Automatically, he's a son or become a child of God. Just like Christ. But look at verse 4 and 5. Very important. Whosoever is born of God overcome the world. That's why he said, Upon this rock, I'll be the church, and the gate of hell will not prevail. Because anybody who had that revelation that I'm the Christ, he became a foundation, I become the foundation in him, and he overcomes the world. But look at the next sentence. And this is the victory that overcome the world. Even our faith. What is that? Let me finish the verse 5. Who is he that overcome the world? But he that believed that Jesus is the Son of God. This is only what Peter said. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So he completed everything now. But what faith is he talking about here? You know, when Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, what answer did he give? He said, the father who revealed it to you. So the faith is in the father who revealed it to you. So when Peter said it, he didn't know where it came from. Where did I get this idea? He said, it's not your flesh, your mind. It's not the blood, your own, whatever you know, that revealed it to you. It's my father in heaven. So this revelation comes from the father. So the faith he's talking about here is in the Father. So you believe that I'm a Christ. Why? Because you have faith in God who revealed it to you that I am the Christ. Do you understand it so far? So belief in Christ and faith in Christ goes together. But what is the problem of faith? The problem of faith is how we continue from here. You know, Jesus told the Jews that my father did not speak anything in the Old Testament. John 5, 36, down to 38 and 40, 41. Jesus was telling them that everything that was said there was about me. The rock that was following them was me, Christ. It's not my father. So in the Old Testament, you know me. But in the New Testament, it is my father who is talking now. Anything you are hearing is from my father. He's talking through me. So now when you believe that I'm the Christ 
and I become your foundation inside you. Why did Christ become our foundation? Because the moment you pronounce that, Christ, the Spirit, becomes your spirit and life. So now you have Christ as your spirit and life. That's why he became your foundation. You, that's why we call born again. This time, not the birth you receive from your physical father, but now the birth from the father of spirit, God the father himself. So there's a change here. Now, you're going to work things out to your mind. Because now, you have become a new creature now. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says saying that, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old is past. Behold, everything has become new. So you're going to work things out in your mind now. Oh, in the past, this thing I could not do it because it's not something which human beings can do. But now, wait a minute, I am not of that nature again. Christ is in me. So Paul said, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me because now my strength is Christ. So I can do everything now. That's why Jesus was saying that, well, with men, human beings, not everything is possible, but not with God. Mark 10, 27. But with God, all things are possible. Christ is God. Jesus is a man. This is where the confession brings, uh, people have confession with it. Christ was in the beginning with God. He was called the Word. And he is the Word which even God himself used to create things. The Spirit of Christ. He was the Word. So when you talk about the word of God, you are talking about him, Christ. Because he was the word. He's, that's his name. He was in the beginning with God. John 1, from verse 1. All things were created by him. There was not anything created that was taught by him. So Christ is not a human being. Verse 14, Christ became flesh. He became a human being. And we saw him as the son of God. So Christ was not a human being. He was born as Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth is a human being. Just like you and me. But the spirit in Jesus is the Christ. So when you also receive the spirit of Christ inside you, you are not Jesus of Nazareth. You are Andrew, John, or Oscar. But you are Oscar's spirit, Christ. Because the spirit in you is, and your life is Christ. You are not the same as Jesus Christ. You have become Andrew Christ, John Christ, Edward Christ. Do you understand this? The power in you and the power in Jesus is the same. Because it's the same Christ. Whether you are a man or woman, listen to this carefully. In the spiritual realm, if you understand the spirits, or you normally see things in the spirit, you see two different spirits. A feminine spirit and a male spirit. These are the only spirit that is the physical in the spiritual realm. Feminine spirit is demonic spirit. In Christ, there is nothing like a queen, a woman. No, there is nothing like that because the spirit is Christ. And Christ is not a woman. Christ is a male. He's a man. The son of God. So, when a woman in the physical realm believes in Christ, he becomes a male in the spiritual realm. The spirit in him, who is her spirit and life, is Christ. So, in the spiritual realm, you will not see her as a woman. You will see her as a man, a king, not a queen. So, there is no queen in Christ, in God, there is no queen. In Christ, or in God, true God, there is no woman spirit. There is no feminine spirit. If you hear about Jezebel, you hear about spirits decorating as women. It's demonic. Because in God, there is no female spirit. If you read Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 3, from verse 26, 
27 and 28, it said, For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For anyone who has been baptized, put into Christ. The word baptized here is not what they think or they say you put in water. You have been put into the spirit of Christ. In the Old Testament, there was a shadow form of presentation. God said to, the Lord said to Moses, make every intensos, because first of all, you decorate it with maybe silver, make chairs with wood, you make the ark of a wood, he mentioned a special wood, shitting wood, special, very expensive wood, very hard wood. Now when you make all these things, cover them with gold, made gold and cover everything in gold, outside and inside. So the wood is inside. It's a symbol of a Christian. The Christian is covered with Christ, inside him and outside him. In your mind, this is what you're supposed to think. When you go to a place, the Son of God is represented by the Spirit of Christ, the spiritual realm. So whenever you go to a place, the demon spirit there sees the Son of God. They sees you. They see Christ in you. If your mind, if you don't know, they can trick you and destroy you because you are very dangerous to that spiritual realm. And when you don't know, you see, it's very difficult for Satan to destroy the child of God. Very, very difficult. There is no spirit, there is no creature who can destroy the Son of God. There's only two things that can destroy the Son of God. And what the devils will use is one of them. The first thing is religion whether it's Judaism or Islam or your own traditional religion. The second is your mind. What do you think? Only these two things. Because what killed Christ is the law of Moses. It makes him a sinner. You know, it's the sinners who die, isn't it? So if Christ was able to die, they able to kill him. It means he became a sinner. And how? Did he sin? How did he become a sinner? The law made him a sinner. Because he was born under the law, he became a sinner. Because his tradition, under which he was born, that tradition, says that if you do this, it's a sin. And once he's counted among them, he becomes a sinner. For example, if somebody is staying in Europe, a man, a married a man, he can go to the law court and marry, isn't it? Why is it not a sin? Why is it not punishable? Because a sin is punishable. Why is it not a sin in Europe? The simple reason is that it's not in the law books of Europe that if anybody does that, that's that is a sin. But do the same thing in Saudi Arabia or Iran. You'll be killed as a sinner. Why? Because in the law books of these Islamic people, it's mosaic doctrine. In Leviticus 20, it's written in the law of Moses that anybody who does that should be killed. And that's the law that Judaism and Islam is following. Or the African culture is following. Other than that, it is just a matter of conscience. Because God did not create this even from the beginning. So it's a matter of conscience. The person has gone over his mind when he's doing that. But it becomes a sin when it is in the law, when there's a law attached to it. Somebody will say, when somebody does something like that, Will God accept him or will God not judge him? God doesn't have a problem with this. God is taught to come at this. Because when a person comes to that point, he has not believed in Christ. And the only thing that can help a person who can be helped by God 
It's when you believe in Christ. And when you believe in Christ, your mind will change. You'll not be like that. I've seen a lot of people who are drunkards. They just need to believe in Christ and change their mind. The power of drinking is broken completely. Paul says something. 1 Corinthians 6, from verse 9 down to 12. 1 Corinthians 6. He said, let me read it to you. From verse 9, he said, Don't you know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither fornicators, adulterers, adulterers, idols, and adulterers, or effeminate, that is, a woman sleeping with a woman, that's to say a lesbian, or abuses of themselves with mankind, that is, a mind kind, a man sleeping with a man, nor thieves, nor covetous. You see, sometimes people don't know that anything that is wrong is wrong, it's a sin. Covetous. You're jealous about somebody. It's called a spirit of spirit of jealousy. It's a weak spirit. I see that Mr. Andrew had a car. And I'm so jealous to the extent that I want something to happen to him because of the car he has. And meanwhile, even something happened to him, I'm not even heretic. But I am because I don't want him to be having that because maybe people are just talking good about him. And they said, but look at your friend. You and him travel at the same time and he don't have it, but you are doing good. So because of that, and it's typically what some people, for example, in Europe, you can buy whatever. Nobody cares. It's your life. Who cares? But some people are controlled by this state of covetous. They come into the church when they become a pastor. God said, give me your car key. <laughs> you see, but had God talked to him. But because of what you have, I was sitting down with a pastor one day and we saw one of the members came with BMW X5 and parked with his wife. You know the what the pastor said to me? A visiting pastor. He said to me, who is this man? I want to talk to him. So I told him after the service that uh, the pastor wants to talk to him. Do you know what he told the guy? Yeah, this car, I want to drive some more. Can you help me to get some? Why do you talk to that man alone? Because he's using that car. Do you know, Europe, car, you can go and take any car you want without even paying anything. Once you are working, you'll be paying it. But this African pastor, car is, is something so coveting after it. So to covet yourselves, drunkards, when does a person become a drunkard? So drunkard said, you see, isn't it? It's not because he drinks maybe, he <laughs> drinks something which contains alcohol, then he's a drunkard. Even the food you are eating, there's alcohol inside. There's alcohol in every carbohydrate you eat because the carbohydrates are turned to alcohol. So it doesn't mean that the person is drinking something that contains alcohol means he's a drunkard. A drunkard is a disease. You can see a drunkard. If you see a drunkard, you see a drunkard. So here he mentioned drunkards. He didn't say a person is drinking alcohol. A drunkard. A revilers. When somebody just reviles revile something, abusive, they're very abusive. That's what you say in another English word. Very abusive. <laughs> abuse children or abusive women or abusing people. When their pastor, he abuses his members. Or extortionists. What does it mean to be to extort? To take people with some trick. God said, Give me. When God has not said anything to you, you are extorting money, extorting things from people. He said, They shall not inherit the kingdom of God. If I come to you and I say, Oh, 
Ben, do you know something? God said, this man, give all your salary to me. And you bless him. God has not said anything. I've extorted money from you. He said, they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The unrighteous. Don't you know that? Now, verse 11. And some were some of, and such were some of you, but you are washed. You are sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. How will you justify? Ju what is justification? Justify means that, well, you, you are a drunkard, but now God is not counting it against you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Because of Jesus, God is not counting this against you again. And by the Spirit of our God, that's why the Spirit of God is inside you. Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, verse 10 says, Romans chapter 8, verse 10, if Christ, the Spirit of Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin. Did not say your body were dead? It's dead because of sin. Because everything in this world here is sinful. Everything you are doing, everything you see, everything you think about, the world is a sinful place. So your body, your outside body, is affected by sin. So it's dead in that sin. But the spirit of Christ in you is life because it's, it's righteous. So in you is the righteous spirit. And because the spirit of Christ in you, the spirit of God is also in you, verse 11. It's the spirit of the Father. Now, if you are in this world, in this flesh, this flesh is very sinful. So, how could God live into a sinful body if you are still a sinner? John chapter 1 verse 29 says that Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, but who qualifies that his sins have been taken away? is the one who believes that Jesus is the Christ. This person, the word of God said in Hebrews 8, 12, his sins and iniquities are no more remembered. Hebrews 8, 12 said, I'll be righteous to the unrighteous deeds, and their sins and iniquities I'll remember no more. Why? Because the blood of Jesus continued to wipe this person's sins from him. But when do we become sinners again? When? Who can tell me when? When we go back to the law. Because the law that will now make us sin. It will make us sin. Because here your justification is in the name of Jesus. It's not by whatever you are doing by the law. Now, the law put back sin into you. People became drunkards again. They become thieves again. They become... What again? What is it written here? Adulteress, adult worshippers, even getting far to be lesbian or homosexuals because of the last put in them by commandments. That comes from the Old Testament. That's what Paul was describing in Romans chapter 7, from verse 7 to 11. Romans chapter 7. He said, I didn't even know sin except the law has said. That shall not covet. Because he said, where there is no law, sin is dead. The verse 8. When sin revives, when the law revi revives, sin also revives. When you revive the law again in your life, I have to obey this, I have to do this, sin will also be revived in your life. And it will kill you, send you to death. Why? Because in the first place, how the sin came into the world? In the Garden of Eden, there was thou shall not eat. If there was nothing like that, the tree was there when God created the man and everybody. The tree of good and knowledge was there with the tree of life before God made that commandment. So maybe if the man was eating from it already before he told him that that tree, don't eat of it. The day you eat of it, you will die. Imagine there was no such law in the garden. Would there be any sin in the world? No. So the reason why there's sin is because there's a law. That's why I said 
somebody, a man, a man can marry in Europe. They can even go to the law court because it's not, there's no law covering that in Europe. But if you do that in Saudi Arabia, it's sin because they are following the law of Moses there. Leviticus law. So it's a, it's a sin. There's a sin, sin. That was why when Peter went back to practice the tradition of the Jews in relating to the two, Paul called them false brothers. They want to draw it back to bondage. They are not walking uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. Because they should know that we are justified by Christ, not by the works of the law. So if you go back to just for saw by the law, the question is, do you still maintain that Jesus was a sinner? Because that's why they taught Jesus. John chapter 9 verse 16, that he's a sinner. Why? Because he's not obeying Moses. And they kill him. So when you, as apostle of Christ, you are just for saw by the law, then you are consenting to the Jews that Jesus was a sinner. And if Jesus died as a sinner, then you are exempted. He didn't die for you because he died for his own self. If he died as a sinner, then your sins are still remaining because then he didn't die for you. So the moment a Christian go back to worship any commandment, sacrifice, or ordinance of the Old Testament, he is exempted from Christ. He is no more covered by Christ because now he's telling the Jews that it's right that you kill him. Jesus was a sinner. My sins still remain. I will take care of my own sins. I will obey the law. Jesus did not obey. It's good that you kill him. I will obey it so that I will not be killed like you, like him. That's why Galatians 5, 4 is saying that Christ become of no effect to any one of you who just fight so by the law. You fall from the grace. That's what it means. Galatians 5, 4. So the only thing which Satan can use to get a Christian and kill him is to drag him to the law. Galatians 5, 8 says that persuasion is not from the one who called you. It's not from God. The second your mind when you sit down in your room maybe you get one glass of wine and you drink and start to think about Pono if you don't think that you're going to rape somebody isn't it because that's what your mind you are feeding your mind if you feed your mind that you want to steal you bound to become a thief if you think your mind that oh I am still the ordinary human being I used to be. Forget about the Christ in me. I cannot do this. Definitely should be like that. Because for you to go forward, your mind has to go ahead. And to get a good mind, it will have the mind of Christ. Second, First Corinthians chapter 2 verse 16. See, all these things were taught by Paul. And you say something to me, right? Andrew, give me something. It's a lot. There's not even that man who's teaching that. I asked him, so why are they attacking Paul? You see, Paul said, my gospel. Well, Paul has his gospel. Paul said, it's my gospel. Christ will judge everybody by my gospel. Well, what Matthew wrote, they said, the gospel according to St. Matthew. Mark has his gospel. Luke has his gospel. John has his gospel. So what is wrong when Paul said it's my gospel? Yes, you are the one teaching it. But your name is attacked to it because you are the one teaching it. But the pastor did not have problem with when they say the gospel. The Bible, the head, the gospel are going to St. Matthew. He didn't have problem with that. But he said Paul is saying my gospel. So Paul is a lie. He's teaching from his mind. Then he said 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. Paul said, I take you, I beguile you to get you. Oh, Paul deceived the people. <laughs> Meanwhile, Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 that as Satan deceive if I'm afraid that you also be deceived because somebody will come and preach another gospel which I have not preached to you. Another Jesus, another spirit, and maybe you follow. But this, verse 13, 2 Corinthians 11, these are false and deceitful workers. They are false apostles. They are workers of Satan. And the Corinthians, like today's Christians, 
I was telling you that church, when you go to church, for example, what do you do? Mark chapter 14, verse 26, what did Jesus do when he meet the people? They just talk and sing hymns. They don't go to church. That long service, singing, dancing, all kind of things. They're saying there, praying. All. That's not how even church meeting. Jesus met with his disciples all the time. What did they do? He teach them. They sing hymns. They go out. That's all. They finish. So why do we make church so complicated? Because we want to, God said, pay this money, bring this money, let's call it this money. We, we, we came and deceive our own self. And so we sit in our own countries, doing that to ourselves, and our country drifting to the hands of devils. Because that's not why we, are form, we form a church in a nation. We form a church in a nation for sons of God to take control of the land. Sons of God to drag away demonic forces from the land. Because who have become a more superior spirit than every spirit. Because the spirit in you is the spirit of Christ and the spirit of God. All the others are spirit of creatures. They can't do anything to you. They are afraid of you. But your mind is turned to some places where you don't know. So he said Paul's taking them. So when Paul went to Corinthians, you know Corinthians told him that Paul was speaking blah 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 when he went to them in Acts chapter 17. The one what he was talking about. So do you know what he used? First Corinthians chapter 2 from verse 1 to 4. So when I came, I was so skeptic, fearing what I even tell you because these are philosophers. The Greeks, they are philosophers. In Europe, those days, they are the ones who are, who are really learned. All the, all the philosophers in Europe come from them. So what word will you teach these people for him to believe you? So do you know what he used? Demonstration of the spirit. Miracles. And get them. Meanwhile, Jesus said, anybody who comes to you to do miracles, prophecy, and do this, he's a false prophet. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, and from verse 20 coming. They are fruits, you know them. What fruits? They will perform miracles. They will use prophecies. They will use deliverances to get your attention. But that's not how you get somebody to Christ. <coughs> because if you put somebody on miracles, you have not got anything. The person will still come to you for miracles. He will not know. Teach him to fish instead of giving him fish. That's Christianity. Because God needs somebody like his son Jesus Christ to take control of this earth. And this is what is built in Christians. Look, you are like Christ. There's nobody potential like you. God's power is inside you. Don't let the word go the wayward because God cannot do anything. But his spirit is in you. God has exalted the name of Jesus. If you place it right now and said, I degree this in the name of Jesus, this should be done. And you insist on it. That's exactly what it's become. Because God power is in you to do that. Philippians 2, from verse 9, no, from verse 8, God has highly exalted Christ. And Christ is inside you. Don't think that highly exalted him is he who is sitting on that throne. Because he's inside you. You are his body. If Christ is exalted, it means you are exalted. And give him a name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee, whether in heaven or on earth, under the earth, should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus is the Christ. And you should cause that to happen. Everybody should know that Jesus is the Christ. You should do that. To the glory of the Father. Therefore, Paul is saying, whether I'm there or not, work out your own salvation. It's not when your pastor calls you for prayers in your home. Whether someone is there or not, work out your salvation. Because when you are walking in the street, the devil knows you. They see, they see you. You think you are waiting till maybe Sunday before you pray. A lot of things can happen. Because you don't even have to wait for things to happen. 
you have to wait for people to go and kill some people during the war before you start to pray? No. So every day, every time, wherever you are, your prayer is to make sure that the right things of God is reigning. Godliness is reigning. It's your responsibility. So when you are following somebody, following miracles, who is an anointed person? You are the anointed person. Why? Because Christ is in you. And Christ is the anointed one. There's no anointed person in the way. You are the anointed person. If a pastor comes to you and makes himself bigger than you, he's a deceiver. Because in Ephesians 4, from verse 11 to 14, the reason why they are apostles, prophets in Christ, mangles, they are pastors and teachers, is to train you, to perfect you, so that you get in your mind, you come to what they call the unity of faith, and in your mind you will think that you have the stature, the stature of Christ, a perfect man, so that you will not be deceived by people who come to deceive you. But you can speak the truth of God in your mouth. From verse 22, you put from your mind the old life, that old Adam life. You put now in you, your spirit of your mind, the new man who is created after God, truly holy and righteous, powerful. So you don't sit down in your home and begin to look at yourself as if you are nobody. When you become a Christian, listen, you are no more Nigerian. You are no more Ghanaian. You are no more German. You are no. You you are be, you become a heavenly creature. You are no more. You don't belong to anything on earth here. It doesn't mean that you take yourself from the world. You take yourself from your Nigerians. You take yourself from Ghanaians. That's all what it means. But in the midst of them, you are the ruler of God. If any good thing will happen in the country, it can it come from you. If any God hand will be on the people, it should come from you because. You are the son of God representing heaven in that family, in that tribe, in that people, in that country. So your country, your people, your tribe should be your number one work apart from your family. You can pray for things to happen in the United States, China, in Russia, and then your country, nothing is happening there. No. Your first prayer should start from there. Your home. You shouldn't allow devils to control. Because that's why you are a Christian at this end time. Look at what Christ said in Matthew 24. A lot of things that are going to happen now. But he knew that somebody will rise up and come into the kingdom at this time. And that is you. The book of Esther, that's the story. What I can say to Esther, Esther, you have come into the kingdom at the right time because devils want to destroy all the Jews. So we have to rise up. Mordecai and Esther saved the Jews in that kingdom, in the book of Esther. If not because of them, all the Jews who have been shorted by Haman, who plan to kill all of them. Do you want your country, everybody to be shorted? Abraham prayed, Lord, if you have ten righteous persons, will you destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? I said, no. Your presence alone in your country is salvation, the land. But Paul used miracles to get these people. But the Christian himself is the miracle worker. You don't need to follow anybody for miracles. The false prophets who perform miracles to attract people, to extort from them. But that's what Paul used. That was why 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, he said, I trick you. Not for evil. You didn't trick them. You didn't take any money from them. Paul never took any sin from anybody. He testified in Acts chapter 20, from verse 33, 35. Have I taken anything from you? So what's that trick? Trick them for what? But because these people with these evil motives, they saw what Paul is teaching in there. It's not mentioned tight. He's condemning the law of Moses and everything that they use to extort people. So right from the day that Paul converted from Pharisee to Christianity, they wanted to kill him. Meanwhile, Peter, James, and John, they were all there. Nobody was telling them anything. 
So from today to today, the spirits of the demon spirits, they attack poor doctrines because of this. But you see, people can deceive anybody, but not you. I tried to explain things to him because he said it to me. I think I should bother. You don't have to bother about this. You don't need to follow a word. This word that you're writing now is not even your life. The letters killed. You pick the spirit from it. The spirit of God, you, the spirit of Christ, you pick from the words and it becomes your life. Reading this is just to strengthen you. It's not, you don't live by the words that are written here. Whatever is said there is not what you read. And so may God will bless you. The potent of God in you should not be in vain. And when you stand to pray and speak things, know that you, you are ordering those things by the power that God has given you. Let's turn our feet on to pray.